So it was normal for me that at two, usually, I eat something and I, I rest a little bit. And I have to confess, uh, I hope my wife is not, she's not listening right now. And the thing, uh, it's, it's stuck in you. Uh, nowadays, from, I don't work from 9 till 1, but when 2 o'clock is getting by, and I need to rest. Uh, or even if I'm not tired, I need to rest my legs. I need to rest my, my, uh, my, my head is so heavy, I need to rest. But am I really lazy? Uh, am I really tired? Because when we program ourselves in a, in a way, in a manner, that thing becomes a habit. And the same thing with laziness. Now, the truth is that when we work hard, we glorify God. Whatever the word is. When we work hard, we glorify God. Now, if we go back in history and read some sources like, like Homer. Homer was a Greek poet. And uh, Homer, in his writings, gives us the perspective of Greeks during all his days. Right, now, let's try to imagine this. Imagine we, we are in this church in Thessalonica, and these people have an idea. They, these people have an idea, they have a thought, because the Greeks thought that work was a curse laid on men by the gods. Obviously, fake gods, uh, fabricated gods. This was their idea about work. That work is a curse from the gods. And uh, this idea still creeps around us today, even in the church. Because some believe that work is a curse from God, now this is God of the Bible, is a curse from God after the fall. But this, this idea, this, this belief is, is erroneous. Why? Because God ordained work prior to Let's, let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took men and put them in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So we can see it clearly. God ordained work before the fall. So work is not a curse. Work is not a punishment on human beings for their sin. But work was affected by sin. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19 reads, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So, sin made work stressful, strenuous, less productive. But this was never in God's Originally. Okay. Now let's fast forward to the future. Because work will also be important. Work will be a part of the world even after Christ's return. The prophet Isaiah had a vision of the world after Christ's return. If we go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, we read, He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat, they shall hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Now the main point in this passage, it's universal peace. But many times it goes unnoticed that the weapons of war will be changed, will be transformed into work. So work will 
be an important aspect even after Christ's return. Another aspect to keep in mind why work is so valuable is because God Himself is a worker. God is a provider. God is a creator. He is a sustainer. Jesus is our savior. He is our redeemer. He is he's, he's a judge. The Holy Spirit is our helper. So we can see it clearly that God is a helper. It is a work. And he never stops working. And the Bible says that we are made in the image of who? We are made in the image of God. We are made in the image of a working God. And this should tell us how valuable work is. In this chapter, Paul says that our work is an example to others. Our work is a part of our witness. Now picture yourself, you're, you're at your work, and the way you work is an example for your colleagues. Maybe they see how, how, how you work hard, the way you react to certain, to certain situations, and by the way you work, by your example, the person might be led to the Lord. So work is an important part of our witness. Let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 7 and 9, and see what Paul had to say about this. Verse 7. For you yourself know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the, that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So Paul is telling them, you saw us, you saw our example, even though we are apostles and we have the, all the rights to, to ask you to give us food, to give us bread. No, we didn't did do that. But this is another subject we will look at maybe on Tuesday. Because Paul was still receiving financial blessings from other churches, from the church in Philippi. But here in Thessalonica, keeping in mind that this was a young church, Paul didn't want to be of a burden on anyone. So he worked, he labored, and people saw him. He was of a great example. Now, knowing that God is a worker, knowing that work is valuable, knowing that work is a part of our witness, what are we to, what are we to do if someone in the church refuses to work? And Paul is going to be blunt here. He's going to, he's going to be direct. Paul, operating in his apostolic authority, commands the Thessalonian church to stay away from anyone who is walking in idleness. He tells them, stay away. Seize fellowship with anyone who is walking in idleness. And this, this word is, is a military term. Um, the, in the Greek, the word is ataktos, which means out of step, out of sync, walking in a disorderly manner. A couple of weeks ago, the pastor gave, gave the example. Imagine you have uh, a soldiers, so you have soldiers, and they are marching. And one of these soldiers is out of sync. Lost, lost, lost the, 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 the pace step. So he is walking in a disorderly manner. And this is the idea that Paul is giving. Alright? So if anyone is walking disorderly among you, stay away from him. 
And the D of fence here, the thing that is out of order is the offense of laziness. If someone refuses to work, if someone is being lazy, that's nothing to do with it. And Paul says this, not because, of, not, not out of pride, or ah, look at me, I'm Paul, the great apostle, that has nothing to do with that person, no. Paul commands the Thessalonian church, and he still commands us today, to seize fellowship, so that person might be ashamed. That's what the scripture says. Why? Because that thing can lead that person to restoration. So when we warn someone, when we correct someone, the main point, the main thought, the main idea should be that that person is restored back. All right. So when we when we correct someone, we don't correct someone out of anger, out of pride, or any of these things. This passage here is a call for church discipline. If anyone in the church refuses to work. And as I said earlier, this applies to all any kind of work, whatever it is, washing the floor, washing dishes, cleaning diapers, running a successful business, uh, work in the church, for cleaning dishes in the church, preaching a sermon, whatever the work is, earthly work and kingdom work. If anyone refuses to work, Cease fellowship with that person. Now, Scripture teaches us to focus on kingdom. And in doing so, when we focus on kingdom work, work, other work, earthly work, we become meaningful. So when we are focused on serving the Lord in His kingdom, other work will become meaningful. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes work is it's just not exciting. Sometimes work can get bored. Something repetitive, always the same routine. So, you know, it's, it's not that exciting. Let me share with you the story. There was this young man started working with his dad's business. And they had a, a tire business. And uh, this man's job was to, so his dad changes the tires. And his job was to tighten the nuts. One nut after the other, one day after the other, one week, two weeks, three weeks. By the fourth week, this young man approached this dad and he told him, listen, I quit, I'm fed up. If I have to tighten another nut, I'll be the next nut. And he quit his job. But the thing is, all right, maybe, it was it wasn't the job that he, he wanted to do. But if our focus is on kingdom number, we will, we will learn how to be content in every situation, in every circumstance. Maybe that's what the Lord wanted out of that person at that time during that period. And that's the way we should approach life. Now, many times I do the same mistake because I find myself a lot at home with the children, fighting, have to prepare food for them, they're always hungry, cleaning dishes, changing diapers, and now I find myself alone and I say, what am I doing? I would rather be working in, in a quarry than being here. But then when I sit down and I start talking to the Lord, and the Lord, in that way that He speaks to there is a season for everything. And we must learn to be content. And when we keep kingdom work in our thoughts, in our, in our heads, we start learning these things. Now, when we work just to eat, that work, as I said, gets more. And this is, this is not a pretty situation to be in. Now, another, another dangerous situation to be in is when you have a lot of time on your hand. 
when uh, we have nothing to do. Let's, let's remember, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, what happened to King David. Now, King David was supposed to be at Bethlehem. But he stayed in his palace, he stayed in Jerusalem. And he had so much time on his hand that at night he went out of his bed and he decided to go for a walk on his roof. He went on the roof and he started walking. And that's when he saw Bechiba. And you know how the story ends. It is important to keep in mind that when we have too much time on our hands, temptation can keep in. So now let's, let's let Paul tell us what will happen when work gets boring and we have too much time to waste. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 11 and 12. For we heard that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons be commanded and encouraged in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Now I like I like this this play of words. Paul says, not busy at work, but busy bodies. What does he mean by that? When we get so busy being lazy, we bore ourselves out. And then what do we do? We start putting our noses in other screaming business. We start complaining, we start criticizing, and we try to manipulate others. And we do this as we heard earlier, this, this, this morning. Sometimes we do this to justify our own selfish behavior. Ah, oh, look at that. Look at that. He doesn't know how to pray. Are you praying? So we try to point fingers to justify our own actions. So when we have too much time on our hands, when we are too late to work, we start putting our noses in our skin. And that is destructive to ourselves and to others. Now mark this down. If we, or let, let me say, when we invest in kingdom work, we will not have the time, we will not have the energy to complain, to criticize, or to manipulate people. Our energy, our focus, our time will be serving the Lord. To see the church grow. When we do these things, we will learn to be content in every situation, in every circumstance, whether in health, whether in sickness, in wealth, in poverty, whatever the situation is. When we do God's work, we will learn how to be content. And doing God's will is the only thing that will truly satisfy. Doing God's will in our life will give us joy, will give us that happiness, will satisfy us, will give us that fulfillment. And when doing so, all other work becomes meaningful also. Now it's important to keep in mind also that God gets the most glory out of our lives when we are most satisfied in Him. When we are content in Him. Let's ask this question to ourselves. Am I satisfied in God? Am I content in God? Or am I to, to focus on others, on other things? Am I complaining about my situation? Or whatever the, whatever the situation is, am I still satisfied? He is our sustainer. He is our supplier. He supplies everything we need. He wants us to trust Him. 
Do I trust God? Or am I trusting in my own self? Brothers and sisters, I am saying this to, to encourage you. Jesus is coming soon. So we need to strengthen each other. We need to work in God's kingdom. Kingdom work must be priority. Now I'm going to read scripture from Luke and we will see this also. Let's go, let's go to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 and 42, and I will close with this. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 and 42. This is when Jesus taught them at Martha and Mary's house. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village, and the woman named Martha welcomed, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was so distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And this, this picture has, has a lot to think about. Nothing will take it away from her. And this is also an encouragement for us. If you're serving the Lord, if you're working for, for God's kingdom, if you're striving and really working hard for the Lord, don't let any complaints and criticism discourage you. For the others, those who grumble, those who complain, I tell you now, I tell you today, set your priorities straight. Serve God's people. Keep kingdom work. And you will see how everything, everything else will be needed. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for another word of review. Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room. Lord, I pray that as we wait for your return, Lord, we will work hard. We work hard, kingdom work. Lord, I pray for forgiveness, for being spiritually lazy many times, for complaining, for criticizing, for thinking we know better than others. And what we are really doing is trying to justify our actions. Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit to take these words and apply them, apply them in our lives. Lord, I pray for each person in this room to strengthen us, to build us up, Lord. We need each other, every one of us, Lord. And if one of us walks in a disorderly manner, all the, ch all the church suffers. So, Lord, I pray. I pray that you will lead us, you will guide us. You will help us to understand the value of Yes, Lord, you are a working God. And we, as your people, we should be people of God. Lord, I thank you, I praise you.